Welcome to the Softland Central Podcast, your home for market entry knowledge and resources. Softland Central is brought to you by Softland Partners, an online marketplace to help you find best fit resources for your market entry. Find them at softlandpartners.com. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to Softland Central. And this is the hub of market entry information, knowledge, and connections. So today we are so privileged to have Angie Rupert with us from uh, Rupert Law in Los Angeles. Uh, hi, Angie. How are you doing? Hello, Bill. I'm great. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, my pleasure. So, Angie, for everybody, so everybody knows, Angie is an immigration law expert, and uh, and particularly her focus is the E2 visa. Um, but she is really an expert on helping entrepreneurs uh, come into the U.S. and uh, and be able to immigrate successfully uh, into the U.S. So. Um, Angie, uh, you know, it's uh, really been great to get to know you, but uh, obviously our audience doesn't. We have people from all over the world and, you know, many of which are, are looking to, if, if not now, um, in some, at some point, uh, begin doing business in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So uh, before we kind of hop into the details of the specific uh, opportunities or, or pathways, um, it would be great to get to know you a little bit. So can you talk a little bit about your background and, and about Rupert Law and, and your specialty? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I've been doing immigration law for several years now, and specifically, as you mentioned, the E2 and helping entrepreneurs through a variety of other visas. Um, and yeah, I'm in Los Angeles. Um, my law firm helps people all over the world uh, get to the United States and run businesses or work at foreign owned businesses here in the United States. Mm, cool. And how did you happen to pick immigration law? Obviously, there are a lot of different choices. So of law, yeah. why, why immigration law? Yeah, it was a, it was kind of an interesting, uh, you know, detour. I started in other types of law and doing all kinds of other things. As in this kind of modern world, I've had I feel like I've had like twenty five different careers, but uh, immigration so far has been the best one. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, there's a great program here in Los Angeles. The LA County Bar Association has an immigration project. And um, some years ago, when I had a baby, I needed just some time off. And so I started volunteering there twice a week. Yeah. And I started learning all of the ropes and, and really seeing how impactful this area of law is. Sometimes you'll hear that from attorneys uh, that, you know, I just was kind of sick of making rich people richer. Uh, that kind of attitude, it was it's kind of hard to to feel good about like your actual day to day. Immigration was great. I love the clients. I liked the, the work. Um, it was really rewarding. And then once I kind of went out on my own, I found that the entrepreneurs who are coming here were the most exciting for me. So that's really where I've been focusing for several years now. Yeah. That's, oh, that's great. So, and you just mentioned the entrepreneurs, the clients who you work with. Can you mm. give us a little bit of a profile of what the clients that you work with, what do they typically look like? Are, are there, uh, you know, certain parameters that make uh, someone really a good fit for your service? Yeah, absolutely. Um, most clients, but not all, own companies in their home country or in another country outside of the United States, uh, and they want to start something here. Maybe it's related to the business in the, in the other country, or maybe it's not. Maybe it's something brand new that they're really ready to try. Um, that is a lot, uh, uh, that a lot of the clients kind of fit into that category. Um, some also say, Hey, I have a company in country X. I also have a company in the United States and I want to send some people over to the United States to help in that, uh, company. And, uh, so that's another kind of area. Um, and so, you know, they're the client, but actually the employees are who are going to be coming over. And then sometimes it's the investors. I want to start a new business in the United States, or I recently started it, but it's kind of floundering. I'm the one that I, I want to go over and work in it. So those are generally the types, um, you know, I have people from all over the world, uh, doing all sorts of things. I guess that's the exciting part is. I have some of the most uh, interesting businesses and interesting entrepreneurs and business owners and employees, specially skilled or managerial or employees coming to the U.S. So, and we have people going all over the U.S. I have clients right now going to uh, Virginia, North Carolina, Hawaii, uh, Texas, you know, California, of course, like all over. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's kind of, it's kind of diverse in that way. Really cool. So one other thing we should just talk about, uh, specifically about you, is uh, you're uh, now the chapter leader 
for uh, Softland Partners and the LA chapter, and you're going to be yeah. running meetups in LA yeah. for market entry professionals. And, and that, to me, it also, you know, really complements what you do as a as a practitioner for uh, for your clients, building that network and and uh, really helping your clients connect in a in a variety of ways. Um, so yeah. can you give a little highlight as to kind of where your first uh, 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 meetup is this coming Wednesday? What are you, what are you excited about with that? Uh, well, it, you kind of hit the nail on the head, Bill, because it really is about, you know, I, I take pride in the services that I offer, but I'm pretty limited, right? So I only do immigration and people say, oh, okay, so what about if I have an S corp or you can't have an S corp because what if I have a C corp and then I want to pay incorporate but then I need to pay taxes in Nevada. I'm like, uh, that would be a great question for someone else. <laughs> and let me direct you to that person. Um, you know, in particular, tax is one of those interesting things because the, the United States has different treaties with every country. And so, you know, folks like that, obviously lots of people who uh, can help people incorporate and give them, this is the tax benefit of doing an LLC versus an incorporation versus a partnership versus this state and that state. Um, and then, you know, I have places that are like, well, I need an office. Like, where should I go? Uh, well, you know, there are the, the possibilities are limitless, but let me give you someone who can guide you based on what you're telling me that you need, your budget, where you want it, that kind of thing. So I have found, and I think that, that you have as well, which is why you kind of started the whole organization is people need way more than one person to, to kind of handle things, right? Um, the United States is a very large country, uh, both uh, population-wise, but also geographically. So sometimes it's great to have a, a big group because you know, for immigration, I can do it for any state. Federal law is all the same, but banking in New York is different than banking in Vermont, is different than banking in Hawaii or Washington State. You know? And so having that great partnership really helps. And I think that it makes the clients, most importantly, uh, really feel comfortable. Um, some of them have a very long history with the United States and currently live here doing something else. And they, they have it. They, they know what they're doing. Some people, I've had clients who have never, ever been to the United States and are getting one of these, these visas. So for them, it's very important to have this great group and, and a network. And it's important for me um, because I don't want to say, I don't know, I mean, figure it out, I guess. I have no idea. You know, that's a not a great answer to give. Um, so uh, if I could, one moment too with the soft landing, one of the ways that that group specifically has helped me, I don't know if you remember this, it was probably about six months ago, I had a potential uh, client call me from Morocco, and she was going to be doing rugs, like, really nice rugs and she's like okay well i really need uh information about like distribution centers for you know um rugs and like some of the different materials we're going to need in the united states i'm like uh, well let me uh check with a friend and so then i called you and you actually connected me with someone that's right and you connected me with someone who was able to at least give some preliminary answers for this potential client so it's just cool. one example so yeah very good. So yeah, having that deep bullpen to be able to, to help clients in, in a variety of ways. Sure. Yeah, yeah, That's, yeah. Right. All, That's right. All good. So well, let's hop into our topic because uh, this is, um, it's, it's, I know a huge question for a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, entrepreneurs and it's something that's been dynamic. Uh, immigration law has changed, you know, administrationally it's changed uh, <laughs> uh, significantly. And, and uh, so I know when I travel abroad, it is a, a consistent question I get is sort of what's it like entering the U.S. and how do we do it? So, mm -hmm. you know, looking today for uh, for entrepreneurs, uh, Angie, what are the what are the various choices in terms of uh, uh, visa types that an entrepreneur has to choose sure. from? Yeah, I mean, there are a variety and they each have their own kind of special requirements. So it really depends on the individual, which one I would recommend. And I focus on the E2, so, you know, I, I think they're a great visa and a great option, but for some people it won't work for a variety of reasons. But usually most entrepreneurs are looking at either an L1, an E2, or maybe an O1. Uh, that would be, those would be the, the most common and, and most frequent and probably the best fit for most. Uh, there's also an EB1, which is a green card, 
Um, and there's an EB-5 for those who are starting much larger companies in the United States. And um, there might even be an H-1B option, maybe. So there are a few others that are kind of borderline and would have to be a very specific fact set. But generally speaking, you're looking at the L-1 and the E-2 are the, the two most popular. Yeah. Right. So let's, let's go in and, and talk about the L-1 then. So hmm. can you give some uh, depth to, so what, what are the parameters of an L-1? What are the strengths of it uh, yeah. If, yeah, for an entrepreneur? Absolutely. So an L-1 is for either an executive or a, someone who is a specially skilled employee to come from a company in a foreign country, anywhere in the world, that is legally affiliated with a company here in the United States. Hmm. Maybe it's a subsidiary, maybe it's a parent, maybe it's just an affiliate. There are a variety of different ways, but it needs to be legally uh, affiliated. And so they must have worked for the foreign company for at least one year in the last three years. And then they want to come to the U.S. company. Uh, there is something at, known as the, uh, the new office option. So, oh, I own this company in country X. We have 12 employees. I want to launch the U.S. branch. So I'm going to be coming over here to do that. Um, that would be one example. Or, oh, I have this company in the United or in, in the United Kingdom, let's say, and I want to start the U.S. company, but I need one of my employees to come over and train some of the U.S. employees for a short amount of time, maybe a year, maybe two years, something like that. That would be um, an example. Uh, requirements would be there has to be a foreign company, always, always, always. If that foreign company closes, you're out. And then also you have to, whoever is going to be coming on the L1, whether that's an employee, an executive, the, the investor himself or herself, you have to um, have worked for the foreign company for at least one year in the last three years. Got it. And is there, um, is there a profile of entrepreneur that that L1 is particularly geared for or you would find uh, best fit for? Uh, yeah, the, the L1 is actually geared toward the larger company. Mm. Um, it's my understanding that it was uh, kind of originated for folks like Disney, Coca-Cola, Toyota, these types of places, these types of places. Um, over the years, it has certainly seen many small businesses and medium size. So that's not necessarily a deterrent. Mm. But the real uh, the reason that this this visa exists is for international employees, Apple. Oh, we have these people, they've worked in the Brazil office. Now we need to move them to the US for you know X, Y, and Z reason, that kind of thing, usually. But again, it is possible for small and medium com companies, but it really was kind of that international executive, you know, oh, we've got 35 offices around the world. I'm moving somebody to the San Diego office, that kind yeah. of thing. And what do you find the, the weakness of the L1 is? What are the yeah, what are the challenges with it typically? Uh, I think the challenges are, uh, first of all, you have to go through two different processes. You go through the USCIS, mm -hmm. which is the Depart Department of Homeland Security here uh, in the US, and then you also go through the Department of State. So you go through the consulate or embassy in the country that you live in. So you kind of have two different processes that you have to get approved through. And they, believe it or not, do not have to agree with one another at all, mm -hmm. in fact. So just because you pass one doesn't mean you're gonna pass the other. Um, I would also say that for the new business, so, oh, I have this company, I wanna start a new one, you have to renew within a year. Um, so sometimes that's difficult. Sometimes that renewal is difficult because maybe the year, you know, what if you did it this year, right? So we have some challenges <laughs> uh, economically and financially in the world. And so, you know, Maybe that's going to be a real problem for people who need to renew really quickly uh, like that. So I would say those are the weaknesses. Also, depending on which type of L you get, whether you're an executive or whether you're a specially skilled person, you know, they go for a number of years, but there's an end point. Um, either you kind of get the green card or you leave at some point. Um, and for like the specially skilled, that would be very difficult to get a green card. So, you know, it's, it could be good if you think, hey, we're gonna launch and we're gonna have multiple employees, we're gonna have revenues and all of that within a year. And I really need to be there for like two or three years to kind of get that going and then I'm happy to leave. It may be a great option, 
But if you're concerned that it may take a few years to ramp up, if you're like, hey, I really want to be in the U.S., like, maybe like for a long time, maybe, or, you know, that kind of thing, it may not be the best option. Got it. Okay. Is there anything else about the uh, L1 that would be important for entrepreneurs to know about? Um, you know, I, I think that that's a really great question, actually. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Not that I can think of. Okay. I, and it, I'm not suggesting that there is, but I did. I, yeah. not, not being an expert myself, I want yes. to make sure that we didn't leave anything yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. I think the, the big ones there are you need to keep the foreign company and not just in name, right? There yeah. need to be employees in the foreign company right. that the foreign company needs to go mm -hmm. um, as long as somebody's here on the L and also, you know, you need to have worked for that foreign company for at least one in the last three years. And the U.S. company needs to be building relatively quickly in yeah. order to do that, the new uh, office visa. Sure. Yeah. So, well, let's talk about the E2 then. And that's yeah. certainly, that's, that's your, uh, that's your home, you have home court advantage on that one. Uh, <laughs> so, so tell us about the E2. What are the sort of basics of it? Uh, so we have a good understanding. Yeah. So I think this is a great, uh, this is a great visa. Again, you can do it as an investor or you can do it as an employee if mm -hmm. you're a manager or a skilled, uh, essential skilled employee. Um, and so as an investor, basically you need to be from a treaty country. There are 68, I should know the exact number. There are many of them, but a lot of countries are not, right? Mm -hmm. So Brazil, China, India, Russia, none of them are treaty countries. Um, there are some other ways to get a treaty country passport if it's very important to you. But let's say you're from Canada or you're from Bulgaria or you're from Argentina, right? All treaty countries. As an investor, you need to invest in the United States. Hey, I want to start this company. Can be any, you would buy something, start something. It can be anything that is for profit and legal. Um, and I'm going to, you know, invest, I'm going to get an office. I'm going to invest in some inventory or what have you, or I'm going to purchase this business. Uh, you do that first, then you apply for the visa and says, hey, I've already invested, you know, $200,000 in a business in the United States. Here's how I've done it. Receipts, bank statements, et cetera and apply for the visa. You can come over for uh, a matter of years. It depends on what country you're from, how long you have that option. And after, you know, when that visa needs to be renewed, you can renew it as long as the, the company still meets the requirements. You can renew it for the next 30 years, 40 years, renewable indefinitely. So it's a really great option for people who want to stay and they're like, hey, I think I want to live in the U.S. Like maybe for the rest of my life, this could be a great option. Cool. And so you mentioned buying or acquiring a business. Yeah. Um, it, it could also be if I want to open an office here or anything like that, where we're, uh, where you're hiring people and or buying property, mm -hmm. setting up mm -hmm. manufacturing, whatever. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really measuring that, that total investment. So, and you had mentioned $200,000. Um, is, is there a minimum threshold uh, in terms of from a treaty country? No, there is not. There's yeah. nothing that is written down. Now, yeah. attorneys that work with these will tell you it really, I mean, you're at a bare bones minimum, but at about 100,000 US. Mm -hmm. um, but again, as you mentioned, the, the true uh, requirement is that you invest a substantial amount. Mm -hmm. That's the requirement. So we know that that means they're looking for a six figure investment, essentially. But as you mentioned, hey, I'm going to start a uh, you know, uh, manufacturing, I'm going to be manufacturing cars, I'm going to, I'm bringing it back to Detroit, I'm going to do that. You may need millions of dollars to invest in order to get an E2 there because, you know, everyone, I mean, if you're to start that and invest $100,000, that's not going to get you through the door, right? Sure. So, um, but hey, I'm going to start, uh, I'm a CPA, I'm going to start a small kind of family CPA firm in Lincoln, Nebraska, $100,000 will probably do it. Right? right, you get an office, you get a few computers, you get a few things in there, yeah. and you can probably do it for a hundred thousand. Sure. So it really is based on the location and also the type of business. Right, is it a sales office versus manufacturing? Yeah, yep. versus whatever. Yes, um, exactly. So you had mentioned that there are some pathways for non-treaty uh, country entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So can you? I, I know that, that gets a little bit complex, but could you talk a little bit about that sure. so people have a sense of those those pathways? Yeah, so there's kind of this whole world in industry, and some of your viewers may know about it, but in uh, citizenship or residency by investment, mm -hmm. 
And there are many countries that offer this around the world. Um, the United States actually offers an EB-5, which is a green card for a minimum of $900,000 US. Um, but uh, there are countries, particularly Turkey and Grenada, that offer citizenship for a certain investment in the and th those countries. Um, they each have different requirements, and I certainly am not an expert on any of it, but it is for a relatively small amount, something around $200,000, $250,000. You invest in certain things within some months, not years, but months, you get a passport from those countries. Uh, so either one of those countries is a treaty country, uh, they both allow for visas for five years at a time, which is the longest anyone allows uh, for an E2 treaty uh, or visa. And then, of course, you can renew indefinitely. But um, yeah, so both of those, I would say a Grenada or a Turkey passport is how most people from non-treaty uh, countries do it. There are a variety of visas, I won't get into it, where they care about where you were born and what you were born, what citizenship you were born as. Uh, the E2 does not. The second you get that Grenada citizenship in the mail, even if you've never been to Grenada, which I actually have a client currently in that situation, you are a Grenada citizen for purposes of the E2, uh, E2 visa. So as long as you've got that passport. And then of course there may be other ways, right? I know uh, there's a lot of Brazilians, not a treaty country, but many of them have European passports, Italian passports or those types of things. They are all treaty country citizens as far as the E2 is concerned. So if you get it through family or some other way, totally fine. Okay. But that's that's what they need is they just need that passport that is valid with your name on it and you're in. So you could, uh, if you had a, a, a Grenadian passport, you could not only get an E2 visa potentially, mm -hmm. but you could go to the Olympics for Grenada. So uh, yeah. maybe a double threat. <laughs> yeah, if you're like super good at skiing, <laughs> I presume the Grenada ski team is not great. Yep. I don't know that for sure, but yeah. For sure. Probably some space on the bobsled team. Yeah. 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 <laughs> exactly. Brilliant. So, um, so how about the, the E2? It sounds like there's some significant strengths. What, what would be the kind of key strengths of the E2? The E2 is great because you're running your own business, right? I mean, as, as an investor, now again, there are E2 employees, but as an investor, you're running your own business. You're doing your own thing and you can pick whatever you want. Mm -hmm. That is legal and for profit. So whatever you want. Uh, so that's, I think a great strength. Another great strength is you have time to ramp up the business. The requirements are that the business pays you enough to support your family and that you have employees at the end of five years. Now, attor attorneys that are in the know will tell you you need employees before that time, but there are no minimum employees either. You don't have to have 10 or 15 or two. It really depends on the business. Um, and it gives you some time and some breathing room to really develop the business before you have to go for the renewal. Um, for most countries, you have very flexible travel. Most, not all, you have to check your passport because some countries, I, I, for instance, I have an Egyptian client right now, their uh, visa with Egypt is only good for one entry, which is not great. But you know, most uh, European countries, even South American uh, countries that are eligible, Canada, Australia, there's a lot of different countries, a lot of Asian countries are unlimited travel. So that's really great. Um, you, you can renew this for the rest of your life. Um, your spouse will be with you as long as you're here. Your spouse will be here. Your spouse will get a work permit and can work anywhere he or she wishes, including starting their own business, working for you, they do not need separate sponsorship to work anywhere. As long, I mean, if they want to be a teacher and a school will hire them, then they're a teacher. They can do whatever they want. The kids are here until they're 21 years old, can attend any school they wish. Um, so I think in, in that way, it's, it gives a lot of flexibility, not to mention that um, the, this is a visa that the U.S. government likes. They like, you're writing checks, you're hiring Americans, they are interested that they love that so it really um you know with 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 good document preparation and a great business you've got a really good shot of getting this visa um so those are the things that i really love about it cool and i know some visas have an annual limit in terms of the number of people they let in does e2 have any kind of limitation in so it's it really it's, it, it's really opportunistic in, it in is 
It, yeah. uh, that's the other great thing. There's not a wait time. You're not going to be, it's not like the EB5, right? A lot of people are looking for alternatives. That's why the E2 is a great alternative. There aren't any wait times other than getting your interview, which usually isn't a matter of, you know, four to eight weeks. Hmm. So as soon as you get your documents together and submit, you're waiting a couple of months to get your interview. And so it's not years and years. You can get here quickly. There are no limits. You know, there are some very popular countries or there are, you know, a handful of countries that do the vast majority of these, but that's fine. What It doesn't matter. There's no wait times, nothing. So it's, it's great in that way as well. Cool. And what is, you mentioned interview, what does the interview process look like? What, you know, what are, how, how do, what should people be prepared for in terms of the interview? Yeah, I, and that's, that's one of the things. That's a great question. And I get that from everyone. Um, that is something that I really strive to do very well too, is once we have that interview date, usually we will get that from the consulate. Every consulate kind of operates their interview schedule differently, but usually they will contact us and say, Hey, it's going to be May 2nd or whatever. Um, then, uh, I will do a fake interview with a person, right? Sure. So we will go over, there are usually a set list of questions mm -hmm. um, after speaking with people who have historically worked for consulates around the world. That's kind of how it goes. They have a set list of questions. They will usually ask questions like, why are you going to be successful with this business? Why did you choose this business? If you have a business partner, who is this person? How do you know this person? Mm -hmm. um, those are very common questions. How much did you invest in this business? How many employees do you expect to have in this business on, you know, in year two, in year five, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you have a kind of more obscure type of business, they may ask, what is this? Right. Um, even if it's explained, you know, if you are operating a sushi restaurant, you're not going to get that question. But I've had some people who have done some really kind of interesting businesses, like very kind of, oh, wow, I didn't even know people did this for a job. Very interesting. So, you know, you get more questions about what is this? You know, I don't understand it just because I don't. Um, uh, and so, and then there may be a few questions that relate specifically to you. Like, oh, I see that you're missing this and this and this. Why? What happened here? Or can you explain how you got your money? Because I understand this one thing, but then this wasn't clear. You know, that would be on a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's what goes there usually depending on the country, depending on the interviewer, depending on the interviewee, uh, 10 to 15 minutes typically really? at the yeah. consulate or embassy uh, in your home country. And then usually they'll either approve you or deny you like right there. So you'll know there's no more waiting typically. Cool. And it doesn't sound like there's any algebra or calculus uh, questions. No, or, no, no, or, well, no, that's and no, no <laughs> physics quizzes at the thing. They just want to make sure you know what was in your application and somebody else didn't just do it for you and you're kind of along for the ride. That, that's, that that's the biggest thing. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Um, and and uh, weaknesses, what would be the weaknesses of the E2? Well, I think the biggest one is one we've already covered, which is you've got to be a, a citizen of a treaty country. Yeah. So if you're not, again, you can kind of get a workaround, but there's an extra step there. So it's not available to just anyone. Um, you know, of course, there is an investment up front, and a lot of people are nervous about that, which I get. Um, you know, you need to invest the money before you apply for the visa. So hmm. in some instances, that means, hey, you don't get this visa, it's going to be a problem, right? Um, I always tell people, though, you know, those visas are generally, as we talked about, they like these types of visas. So they are generally approved uh, worldwide. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're working with an attorney, your approval rate, the, 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 uh, the, um, it goes up for sure. So that's the good news. And I also tell people, hey, you bought this business. Worst case scenario, somebody will buy it from you. Right. Or you bought the inventory, sell it. Um, that usually doesn't happen because most people get approved for these things. Um, in addition, you are not locked to, hey, if you don't get it in the first interview, it's over. Because sometimes you go, you answer a question, they don't really understand it, or maybe they need a little bit more information, or hey, could you bring this back? Like, we're asking for these documents, you didn't bring them, can you, you do that? Then you do that, you bring it back, and you could be approved on the second interview. It's inconvenient, and it's not great, but it can happen. So, um, anyway, I digress a little bit. But yeah, because needing to be a, a, a member of a treaty country and needing to get that investment up front, those are probably the two biggest deterrents. 
But if you have a legitimate business, which all of my clients do, I wouldn't take it otherwise, you know, your odds of getting approved are, are really good. Cool. Well, that's great. And are there uh, anything else with the, with the E2 that would be helpful for our audience to know? Yeah, I mean, I would think, um, I don't know, the flexibility is just so great in my opinion, uh, really just allows, you know, I get that call, well, should I buy a business? Should I start a business? And I'm like, I don't know. What do you like? What do you want to do? And I get calls sometimes too. People are like, oh, you know, my cousin found this, you know, gas station and maybe I can buy it. And I'm like, you can, if you have been destined to run a gas station, then you should. But if you want to be an accountant or if you want to run a marketing company or if you've always wanted to have an ice cream shop, you should do that instead. Because, you know, for the E2, here's actually a, another answer to your question in the long way. But um, sometimes people get confused, especially uh, people who know about the EB5, but maybe don't know about the E2. It's a little bit rarer. Um, it's not rare, but it's not as popular. It hasn't gotten as a lot of press as EB5. So in the EB-5, you make the investment, you sit back for several years, then they call your number and you come over here and you kind of move on, right? Many of those investments are through, oh, we're helping build this new stadium in the middle of Denver or, we're, you know, whatever. I mean, you're not going to work there. You don't, you write the check, you wait, and away you go, right? After your time. For the E-2, you are expected to direct and develop the business. So if you buy a gas station, you're going to be working at that gas station. So if that's what you really want to do, you should do it. Right. But if you're thinking, I don't think that running a gas station for the next 30 years is my calling, then you should do something else because anything is possible as long as it's legal and for profit, you know, and if it's offering a good or service, anything is possible. Same with the location. Well, my cousin lives in Vermont, but I really hate the snow. I'm like, Vermont is not the place for you. Like you need to go wherever, go to Phoenix, whatever you want to do. So it's really flexible in that way, but, but know that whatever it is that you are purchasing or starting, you are going to need to work in it. Like most days, you know, you're going to be directing and developing this business. So pick something you like or are interested in or feel really confident in. That's what you should be doing. Cool. No, that sounds really good. And um, so you had mentioned the uh, 01 visa uh, mm. in within this group of, mm -hmm. of possibilities, although probably not as strong a possibility. Can you give us a little bit of an overview of the O-1? Sure, so the O-1 is called uh, Extraordinary Ability. There are two O-1s. There's an O-1A, which is what we'd be talking about more on the business side. So you have an extraordinary ability and, and business science, that type of thing. The O-1B is the much more uh, popular one as far as just kind of out in the zeitgeist, what people know about. And that is the um, uh, actor, singer, dancer, that's in the arts. Mm. Uh, so a lot of your favorite celebrities are probably here on an O-1. Uh, but there is an O-1A, which is for, for folks in the sciences and in business. Um, it is a little bit less popular because you need to have extraordinary ability. And sometimes if you are in the world of CPAs, for example, how do you prove that you're extraordinary, right? So as an actor, you can say, oh, I won an Academy Award. I did this. I went to Cannes. I was in this commercial. I have, you know, 400 million followers on Instagram, all of that. For a CPA, uh, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to prove that you're extraordinary as a CPA, right? Um, so it's a little bit trickier in that way. Also, you need to have someone who can hire you and fire you, right? So you either need a board, you need a a uh, business partner of some sort, mm -hmm. uh, because it is not a self petition. Someone needs to petition for you. So it is a, a job, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, again, you could have some ownership in the company for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but so those are two that, that make it a little bit more difficult. Um, I did an O1A some years ago uh, for someone who was uh, in the world of biotechnology and had kind of invented this drink. Very interesting, actually. This is why I love my job, because I'm like, whoa, somebody can do that? Like, that's amazing. Uh, it's the same thing that I feel when I watch Dancing with the Stars. I'm like, God, you can dance? Like, what does that feel like? Like, I, you know, I like 
you know, snapping my fingers and walking at the same time sometimes is a, a problem. But uh, so he invented this drink. And so as a result of that, he got tons of press for it. It was in the sciences and in business, right? Because he had like launched this drink and they were p pitching it here and pitching it there. And then he wanted to come to the U.S. to do more. So that's like a great example of somebody that may fit with an O1A. But, you know, I, I've kind of run my own hair salon for the last 10 years. Like, I don't maybe you maybe you got press on it. I don't know. Maybe you make millions and millions of dollars. But it's somewhat difficult if you don't have one of those kind of, I guess, uh, you know, I guess a, like a high profile or like a, a job that people would kind of consider to be extraordinary kind of, so. So you're saying my hairdresser, probably not a good candidate. Yes. Does that <laughs> Did a really good job. <laughs> not at all. Very simple. <laughs> Didn't leave one hair behind. Exactly. Yeah. Um, that's really, okay, so that's cool. So the O1, very specialized, uh, people with really unique skills. Probably, I mean, thinking of the sciences and, um, you know, the high tech area it could be yeah. somebody with a robotics company that has some unique application or, yes. uh, or some type of uh, biotech type company that uh, has some novel uh, technology. Yeah, that would be a great fit because you, you have somebody like an Elon Musk who probably has a green card, but, hmm. you know, so that's a very extreme, you don't need to be that extreme, <laughs> right? You can be just a regular kind of person too, but yeah, I mean, where, oh, I, I actually, I had a, a person call me once uh, who, he was super young too. I was like, oh, he was like 20 or something. He's like, oh, I got an O1A because, you know, he had developed some app and they'd written tons of articles about it. I don't remember what it was, but, you know, something like that. Oh, yeah, I've been, and, and even without, outside of that, you know, it's possible that, hey, within all of these trade publications, you know, I'm in the world of, you know, reupholstery, but I've been in every trade publication. Like I've designed fabric for, you know, the queen of England and I've done it, you know, there are ways that you can kind of get it, but for kind of just your regular person who's good at what they do, but maybe just has kind of more of an ordinary type job or whatever, it's a little bit difficult to show that you're extraordinary at it to meet those requirements. Yeah. Yeah, when when you have uh, on your client list the Queen of England, that's a probably yeah. Pretty, pretty, pretty if impressive. if you're in if you've got that and you'd like write maybe she even submits a letter. Oh my God, this is the best chair I've ever owned. <laughs> You'll probably probably get your visa. You go to the front of the line. Um, yes. Okay, so we've talked about the L one, the E two, and the O one. Yeah. Um, and it you did mention the uh, EB five, and and I know there are others, but are there are what other um, visas it, should we just chat about is just maybe in a light way um, about you know other alternatives or pathways um, maybe not as preferred or as specific for entrepreneurs but are there are there any others that entrepreneurs should know about and um, yeah I, you mentioned the EB5 uh, mm -hmm. some people do as we talked about there are um, most people do what they call regional centers which is oh yeah they're building a new stadium in Denver they're building this huge you know, conference center in Minneapolis or what have you. Uh, that's what most people do because you to meet the uh, employee requirements, to meet all of the investment, that kind of thing. But some do what they call direct investments. So going back to that manufacturing company, right? Oh, I'm going to be manufacturing cars. Well, you're going to be millions of dollars in before you're ready to apply. And you're obviously going to have lots of employees. So that may be a way just skip the E2 altogether, get that going and apply for the EB-5, which is a green card, right? It's an investor green card. Again, it's a minimum of $900,000 at this point. Um, if you're within an economically you know, designated area, they are starting to get tougher on what that those areas are. So it may be that you need a minimum of $1.8 million, which is the next. Uh, but certainly, if you're investing more than $1.8 million, the EB-5 will work for you, um, you know, if you, if you meet the other requirements, employment requirement, requirements, that type of thing. So that's one option for uh, entrepreneurs who are like, hey, go big or go home. I, I know what I'm doing. I'm going to be doing this big, you know, manufacturing. I got all this stuff. I got all these employees. The EB-5 could be a great option. Mm -hmm. um, there is a way to get an H-1B, but I never recommend H-1Bs for a variety of reasons, the largest of which is it is a random lottery. So 
If you are not chosen from a completely random lottery, you have to wait another year to apply again in a random lottery. So I never recommend that one unless that is literally the only thing you can do, which is not going to really be for the, this crowd that, that's watching today. Um, there is an E1. So an E1 is a similar requirements to an E2, except for it is a company based only on trade. So you have to be trading primarily between the United States and your home country. You can trade some other international places as well, but goods or services between your home country and the United States, um, that is an E1. Uh, there are a few countries where an E1 is available and an E2 is not. Mm -hmm. Those are usually the only countries that I recommend for an E1 because an E2 almost is the same, except for then you don't have to worry about keeping your trade only to one country. You could expand beyond just trade. So an E1 is an option if you are from a country that allows E1, not E2. Uh, Greece is one of those countries, for example. I'm trying to think of others. Israel used to be, uh, Israel was just approved for an E2 about a year ago, but before that, Israel was E1 only. So there were a handful of countries. Um, geez, and that is, I would say for the vast majority, it's gonna be in there. And mostly L1s, E2s, yeah. vast majority. Sounds cool. Oh, so, uh, how do how do entrepreneurs navigate the process? I'm in, you know, uh, pick a country. You mentioned Brazil. Obviously, that's a little more complicated because they're not a treaty country. Mm -hmm. um, maybe if we could talk about sort of a non-treaty company or country, yeah. and then and navigating the process uh, from say Brazil, and then maybe a treaty company like the U country like the UK. You know, what's mm -hmm. the how do we navigate that? So maybe taking the the non-treaty country first. How does how sure. does an entrepreneur navigate that? Right, so, hey, I am a, well, I guess there's a few different things. So I have a Brazilian passport. I'm a Brazilian citizen, lived in Brazil my whole life or not, whatever, but that's my passport. Uh, so there's two different ways you could go about it. Number one is I own a company in Brazil that, I, that has multiple employees. I plan on keeping that country in Brazil and I'm going to start a new company in the United States. Great, you might be a perfect fit for an L1. Option two, I do not have a company in Brazil, but I've saved my whole life. I've got this investment. Next step, do you have Italian relatives? Maybe you can get an Italian passport. Or are you able to get a Turkey or a Grenada passport? Or another one, maybe. I mean, who knows? You might have relatives in Canada, or I have no idea. You know, I would, it, but if, you know, if, if you don't have the dual citizenship already, you've probably already explored that in Brazil. It's one of those countries that just almost everybody has dual citizenship that can, mm. right? So uh, maybe that's where you say, okay, I'm going to get the Grenada citizenship. I'm going to get the Turkey citizenship. Then I'm going to go for the E2. Mm. Um, if, you know, if you are playing more of a long game, maybe you say, all right, maybe what I'll do is I'll start a company in Brazil. And in three years from now, I'll apply for the L. Right. Uh, I know that I'm going to need to get some employees. I'm going to need to get some revenues. I'm going to need this elder, this business to be able to run by itself a lot of the time. Right. Because I'm going to be in the United States a majority of the time. Then you can start that. Um, you could also say if neither one of those you feel like is going to work for you, then you say, hey, all right, I've got a couple of buddies that live in uh, uh, Colorado. And maybe we could all start a company together. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be, I know, you know, we have some ability in X, Y, and Z area. Mm -hmm. What I'm going to do for the next 24 months is I'm going to get, I'm going to be in every blog, trade publication, whatever. I'm going to get my salary up here in uh, Brazil. I'm going to try to meet those extraordinary ability requirements of the O1. Um, so, but I would say probably an L1 or an E2 through that second passport are probably going to be better bet. Mm -hmm. But again, that, that kind of just gives you a, an example, right? Like, well, do you have friends that you could open a business with? Do you already own a business? Could you get a second passport? All of those things are questions, right? And we'll kind of put you into whatever category. Also, hey, I'm a Brazilian citizen. I don't have anything else going on. Um, I don't even have a company, but I inherited about 2 million bucks. Ah, EB-5, right? right? So there's another option um, for somebody from the UK or Canada or Argentina or, you know, myriad of other countries. 
you would say, uh, hey, I'm ready to start a business in the United States. What do I want to start? That's always the first question. What business do you want to start or buy? People come to me, what do I buy or start? Like, I have no idea. And I wouldn't even recommend to you because you would probably hate whatever I recommended anyway. So whatever country, company you want to buy or start, in whatever state you want to buy or start it in, doesn't matter to me. Uh, and then kind of go through that E2 process, which is make the investment. And that's something that I work with clients on too. Like some, some businesses are very simple. Oh, I'm buying a hotel. It's a $200,000 hotel. Okay, buy it. That's easy, right? Investments made, we're ready to go. Some people come to me and they say, well, I really want to start a marketing company and I need about $30,000 to start it. And I'm like, that might be true. But you also have a second layer of an immigration requirement, which is a substantial investment. And $30,000, particularly if you have to go through the embassy in London, is not going to pass that test. Mm. So then the second question becomes, well, how am I going to spend $100,000 on a company that like essentially runs out of a WeWork, right? Buy two. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Start like 20 of them. So that's one of the things I work with clients on too. And I always tell them do the 18 month test, sit down, write a list of everything you're going to need for the next 18 months and buy it all now. Right. Oh, I need, I need one computer for me. And then I am going to have an assistant who doesn't need a computer. And then in two years, I'm going to have four employees. I'm like, great, buy four computers. Oh, you thought you were going to buy the Dell? Buy the iMac Pro. <laughs> Great. Like, you know, these are the things, oh, you're, you know, you want to start a marketing a campaign and it's going to occur over the last next 12 months, pay for 12 months up front. Just get it done now. All of that stuff. Two birds with one stone. One, you meet your investment threshold and two, now it's just all profit. You've already paid for your lease for a year. You've already paid for your marketing for a year. You've already bought all the computers. Like now you just sit back and make money to pay yourself back for that. Right. So, um, that would be the the step for the the UK or the treaty country citizen hmm. is figuring out the business, how you're going to make that investment, making the investment and then applying for the visa. That makes sense. Yeah. So, um, you know, I would imagine, and I think you alluded to the fact that it, sometimes people uh, sort of uh, uh, go through this process or, or endeavor to go through this process themselves, sort of self uh, DIY, I guess, do it yourself mm -hmm. uh, yeah. process. So uh, working with a professional such as yourself, mm. what, what, um, uh, what advantages are there in that process or maybe what hazards have you seen happen when people try to do it, do it themselves? That, that may be an easier way yes. to identify. Yeah. yeah, so the E2 in particular, the thing that makes it great is also the thing that makes it almost impossible as an individual, um, which is there aren't very many requirements. And there is no guideline about how to show any of those requirements, right? So you said, oh, what's the investment? There's no minimum. Yeah. How many employees do I need? No minimum. How do I show investments? I don't know. How do I find the source of investment? Just show it. So those are the requirements. Show it. Do it. You know, and I'm like, wait, what is that? So in the E2 in particular, experience with filing these, is all that you have. And if you've never filed one before, it could be very difficult um, because there are not um, specific ways that you prove different requirements, right? So, uh, and everybody's case is different. Mm -hmm. No, that makes sense. So that makes you and here will do whatever. I just, I, on the other hand, I've been working for the last 15 years and I've got two duplexes that I make some money on. And then I sold this other business that was like three years ago. And then my mom gave me 25. I mean, like, how are you going to show all of that? What's more, some countries have page limits. So then you got to figure out, okay, what's actually an important document and what's not, because I can't include it all. How, what, what do I need to include in this business plan? Where do I even start? Then back to soft landing, right? Which is oh, I don't even know how to do this. I wish I had someone who could introduce me to somebody that can help me do X or Y. Or, hey, I really want to find a business, but I don't even know where to start. Or uh, I bought this business, but it's losing money. Can I still apply for an E2? What documents do I need to show that I can turn it around, right? It's, lo it's a loser now, but I can turn it around and win. And So it's just 
a wild, wild world. And um, in fact, that is the reason that I focus so much on it because there are so many weird nuances with the E2 that you need to do it most of the time in order to understand all of the potential fact pattern, you know, missteps or weird things and different consulates do things in different ways and some email and some mail and then how do you make the appointment and, you know, just the logistics of it alone. Um, some people have a very simple case, but most people don't. And, and I'll be honest, like I still get calls to this day of people that are like, well, here's the deal. And then here's what happened. And this other thing happened. And I'm like, huh, we'll make it work, but I'm not exactly clear on how we're going to do it right now, but we're going to figure it out. So there are so many potential pitfalls specifically with the E2, because there is just very little guidance. Yeah. And and when you're working with the Department of State, which you normally are for an E2, it all comes down to who does your interview. That's the reality. So you have to put these documents together and prove the requirements in such a way, this is what I tell all my clients, we're going to put this application together in such a way that only a crazy person would deny it. Every once in a while, you get a crazy person reviewing your documents, just so you know, it happens. But we're going to make it so clear because any questions just reduce the odds of approval so you've got to just you need to know how to lay out that application show them what they need bullet point it out only the exact documents they're looking for nothing more nothing less mm -hmm. it's just a lot i don't even remember your question but there was an answer for you <laughs> or something i don't remember so yeah, well, and, and no, you answered it perfectly, and and it, it but I, I think if I were going to summarize, is is really your role in the process is to act as a translator. It's sort of to take oh. all of all of their stuff, and 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 also to objectively look at where they are. Besides sort of organizing it in in the application process and guiding them with the interview, it 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 sounds like your work even potentially in some cases starts before that in terms of. Uh, oh. Guiding them or or connecting them to investment uh, possibilities that uh, that help them with the requirements as well. Yeah, I mean, and and I'll give you a, a thirty second overview of how I work specifically because yeah, sometimes people go, oh, okay, well, when I get all these documents together, I'll call you. I'm like, no, 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 because you don't want we don't want to have to go back and switch a bunch of stuff that you already did and now it's running in this weird way. So I tell people, once you have decided on the business that you're either going to buy or start, and you know that you have the money, you can, you have access to the money, that is when you call the attorney. So I look over the purchase agreement, for example, for immigration purposes. I don't know anything about the value of the business or, you know, what you're buying or what you're not, but making sure that some of that language that I need to see from an immigration side is there. Um, and then every two weeks during the entire process, it takes most people three to four months to get all the documents together that we need for the E2. Every two weeks throughout that process, and some people have been with me for more than a year, mm. for sure. Uh, so we talk that whole time. They ask questions. Okay, well, we talked to this person, but they said they can only give us a receipt if it looks like this. Is that okay? Or... I, I, you know, we tried to open the bank account. It won't let me do it. Can I pay for my personal account in the foreign country? And like, how am I going to get all of those questions we work through together? Um, so that's why when we talked about that service industry thing too, like, how am I going to spend all of this money? We talk about that and think through some different options. We talk about all of those things. So yeah, it's really important to have an immigration attorney with you the whole process. Yeah. Then once that three to four months of document gathering is up or however long it takes you to get the documents, then I put all of those documents together and then submit to the consulate. Then we do the interview training once we know when your interview is. So it is definitely, it is not um, where I just put a bunch of, I put a PDF and an email and send it off. It, if only, oh my gosh, life would be much simpler on my end. But it is a, it is an entire process that usually lasts about six months with them with a client. That's the average from the day they sign up till the day they get the visa. It's about six months ish, um, or long. Some believe me, I've had many, many longer, and I've had some shorter too. But um, yeah, and it is a hand holding. It's really a white glove service. We walk you through every single step all along the way. Very cool. Very cool. So how would you suggest somebody go about selecting an attorney for uh, to work through this process? Yeah, I mean, 
for sure somebody who has experience doing it. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of right off the top. But then I would also say somebody that uh, you feel really comfortable with. And I tell people that all the time for attorneys. Um, sometimes you work really well with people and they are very interested in what you're doing and vice versa. And then sometimes, you know, you get someone, you end up talking to the um, paralegal most of the time, they're very confused, they don't really know what you're doing, you know, whatever. And, and sometimes it's location, right? Like I do things all over the world. My clients are not even all over the US, they're all over the world. Um, and a lot of people like that very simple process. We do Zoom calls, we do just do WhatsApp calls, everything goes into online files and you know, a lot of people like that. Some people are really like, I'm starting a business in Houston, Texas. I need you to be in Houston, Texas. You don't, but some people want that, right? So great, you need to find an attorney who's located in Houston, Texas or what have you. Um, you know, and some people are uh, really want a specific type of experience. Mm. Um, you know, oh, I need somebody who's done surface-based businesses with E2. Fine, yeah, yeah. You should talk to somebody who's done a lot of surface-based businesses with E2s. Those are the types of things that I say to look for. Experience is the most because in E2s, L1s as well, but E2s in particular, like experience is the only guidance that any of us have. There, there's nothing, there are no rules, there's no regulations, there's no statutes that give you any kind of real guidance in how to do it. So you said experience and then, um, and then also the, the, the amount of rapport you have with the yeah. person. Yes. Um, are there particular questions that, um, you know, you wish you were asked, but you sort of rarely are asked by, by clients that mm. you just go, you know, because I know in our business, uh, I get questions periodically that, you know, that I, we love because it shows the clients really paying attention um, and they're really considered about the process. But is there a, a question that, that you wish you got more often? That is good. Uh... I do this for a living. <laughs> I was going to say, geez, Bill, you got this interview thing down. Next time you're going to be bawling about something. <laughs> Tell me about um, your mom. No, kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, that's a really good question. I think the clients that work well with me are uh, maybe a little bit more prepared. Sometimes I get people who are like, okay, great, let's do it. But they haven't. I, I know they haven't really thought through like, what does that mean? So I would say the best clients are ones that have maybe done a little online research as well. So mm -hmm. they at least have some sense of what is this? What are the basic requirements, right? Oh, I knew I'm going to need to pick a business. I'm going to need to invest in that business. Like just having that information is great. Um, and I would say, yeah, so, so people maybe who have done a little, a little bit of homework on it um, are the best. Has to, I'm trying to think of a really good question. I can't think of any right off the bat that are like, I wish people asked me this. Mm, okay. um, because yeah, there's just, everybody's so fact dependent, right? So every case is kind of different, mm. kind of, yeah. Yeah, very much so. Um, well, this has been, been great, Angie. Is there <laughs> anything else about the visa process and particularly for entrepreneurs uh, looking to enter the US Anything else that you would want to share that uh, in some way might, might help uh, folks coming in? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, enthusiasm is great. I, I, as you can probably see, I have quite a bit of it. I love entrepreneurs. <laughs> I love these. I love helping them get to the U.S. Uh, because I also think the U.S. is great. And having super smart, motivated people in the U.S., like, how could we go wrong? Like it's, it's awesome all the way around. I love it. Um, so having a lot of enthusiasm is going to help. Um, you know, I think that, that most people who move through with this probably own their own business or used to own their own business. So they know it's, it's not uh, a breeze. You're, there's going to be, you know, we got to get some documents together. Then you're going to be here running a business, right? So uh, there's work involved. But anybody who just uh, has a real enthusiasm um, for their business and has an enthusiasm for getting to the United States is going to make a great candidate. Um, and is, and um, so, yeah, I just, that, I think that's, that's something that's going to make people really um, going to, they're going to do great. They're going to do great. Uh, if they have enthusiasm, they know their business, they know what they want to do. They're sure about their decisions and that they're going to do great. Perfect. Well, this has been phenomenal. Thank you so much, Angie, for taking Thank the time. You. I think the information you've shared is really going to help a lot of entrepreneurs. So um, 
yeah, kudos to you, standing ovation, uh, a round of applause, all those types of things. Uh, but uh, thank you so much. And thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. This has been, been a lot of fun. So uh, Thanks, we'll talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye now. Okay.